Hello, young scholars. This is Mr. Marderone. Welcome to World Cultures. And in today's Philip Classroom, we're going to take a look at life in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa during Era 4 and the Middle Ages. So our story starts in 632 when the prophet Muhammad dies and his close friend and father-in-law, Abu Bakr, took the title of caliphate or elected political spiritual leader of Islam. By the mid-600s, these caliphates united the Arabian Peninsula and defeated the Persian Empire. By 711, they carried Islam into Europe, including parts of Spain, and it's got as far as France, but were defeated. And by 750, the Muslim Empire had reached its greatest extent from Europe to India. In these lands, people of many different cultures lived under the rule of the caliphates. And in 762, the Abbasid family moved the capital from Damascus to Baghdad, and this became a major seat of power. The city itself was incredibly wealthy, and this became an important connection for Afro-Eurasia. This move is often seen as the making of the beginning of the Islamic Golden Age in which science, art, and culture flourished. The Abbasids sponsored scholars to explore knowledge gained from foreign works rather than relying solely on the guidance found in the Quran. A later caliphate under al-Mansur established a library in Baghdad to house his collection of manuscripts. This became known as the House of Wisdom. This is really important, young scholars. With the fall of the Roman Empire, all of the records and scholarship of the Greeks and the Romans were almost lost. But it's the Arabs who come along and preserve these records. So they begin to preserve Greek literature and they translate it into Arabic. Arabic mathematicians use zero as a number system developed by the Hindus. They made advanced discoveries in algebra and made important discoveries in optics and the study of light rays. Muslims also excelled in the field of medicine. There's evidence that Muslims wrote medical encyclopedias. Muslim doctors developed advanced surgical procedures and treatments for diseases far before Europeans did during the Middle Ages. So Baghdad became the intellectual and cultural center of the world. It also became the trading capital of the world. Anyone who's traveling from Europe to China through the Silk Road is going to move through Baghdad, which means that the Islamic footprint on the world is profound. There's also evidence that during the golden age of Islam, women had a greater degree of freedom and rights than other women around the world. For example, women had property rights, had the ability to divorce, they had inheritance rights from their husbands, and they had negotiable marriage contracts. It is worth understanding that these rights were put into practice differently depending on what region and social class you belong to, much like we've seen in our study of women around the world. In public, women covered their bodies with loose outer garments. While they didn't attend public school, they did have their own educational communities with other women. They also could buy and sell products and services in their homes, and women worked oftentimes as peddlers, midwives, and nursemaids. Traveling south from the Islamic empires below the Sahara Desert is the, are the sub-Saharan kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, and the Songhai. So from about 300 to 1500, these three large kingdoms arose in West Africa and traded with the Romans and the Muslims. The Ghanaians mastered the art of ironworking and developed a wealth from trading gold and ivory in exchange for salt and copper. In Mali, wealth was derived from ivory, cotton, and cattle, and women had a large degree of freedom. And the Songhai Empire was one of the most powerful African kingdoms, and many commercial towns emerged, which included crafts workers, business people, judges, and doctors. One of the most famous and most important people to come out of the Malayan Empire was Mansa Musa, who ruled from 1312 to 1337 Common Era. And Mansa Musa is most known for the Hajj that he made from Mali to Mecca. He made this pilgrimage in 1324, and he was accompanied by 60,000 people and 500 slaves. When he arrives in Mecca, he immediately impresses the people there, and upon his return, he brought back many talented people from the Islamic empires, including teachers, artists, engineers, all of whom made this town of Timbuktu a great center of learning and trade for the West African empires. And these empires continue to thrive for several centuries until the arrival of the Europeans in the 1500s. 
If you missed anything, please go back and watch this video. And if you have any questions about any of the Islamic empires or the sub-Saharan kingdoms, don't hesitate to email me or reach out to me on Google Classroom. Until then, I'll see you in class, young scholars. Have a great day.